Welcome to Ripley Community Church. How are you feeling this morning? Oh, man. So some of you have asked me a question. You've asked, how come we never have a worship night? And here's my answer. I don't know. We should. <laughs> and we're going to. April 19th, put it on your calendar. April 19th, 7 o'clock, we're going to do a worship night, and it's going to be just singing and prayer and getting closer to the Lord. But I want to ask you a favor. If you have a song that really moves you close to the Lord or you know that it moves others close to the Lord, I'm going to ask you to write it down. On um, I think we have the red cards. And um, I may do that one. We may do that on April 19th. I can't guarantee that I'm going to do your song, but I'd love to know it. And I'm um, really super excited. And also, feel free to invite someone. This is going to be an intimate night of worship. So it's a little different than when we do the summer concert on the green. But I just encourage you to be there. And I hope to have to be singing with you. Okay? Woo! Good morning. My name's Melissa. Well, a couple of months ago, we introduced the song, The Commission. And we thought it was a, a perfect week to do that song again, a week after Easter. Uh, hopefully some of you re remember it and you can sing along with us. But it's such a beautiful song. It's sung from the perspective of Jesus. So I'm singing as if I were Jesus. Whoa, that's, that's a big pair of shoes to fill. <laughs> but anyway, I'm singing from Jesus' perspective and um, he's singing to all of us. And he's asking all of us to tell the world all about him. So we hope you'll sing with us.
Father, you are so, so good, Lord. Father, even in our times of struggle, you are there. And somehow you get us through, Father. Father, I can honestly say that if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be standing here today. And I'm sure a lot of us have that same story. If it wasn't for your goodness, we wouldn't be here. Father, I just thank you for that. Lord, I just pray that with today's message, Lord, that you would help us, Father. Because sometimes in our times of struggle, in our weakness, with what's going on in our lives, Father, we just hold it in. And Father, as myself, sometimes I don't even ask you for help, Lord. 
because I'm thinking I can do it on my own. But I know we can't, Lord. You've created us, Father, and gave us a new life, Lord. And Father, I just pray right now that help us to put aside our pride. Help us to put aside how we think people might think of us as weak. But Father, the word says where we are weak, you are strong. And if you are in this, Lord, there's nothing that, that can stand against us, Father. And Father, I just pray right now, open our hearts so we may hear what you have for us this morning. We ask in your very precious holy name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to River Community Church. My name is Sam. I'm one of the pastors here. It is so good to be here with all of you. Uh, last weekend we celebrated Easter. It was it was incredible. It was such a wild thing to be here with so many of you. And some of you I've already talked to this morning. You're you're back after being here, maybe for one of your first times on Easter. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. It's going to be a, a great next number of weeks. We are stepping into a series that uh, we've never done here. Nothing quite like this before. Uh, the series that we're getting into is called Not Okay With Fine. And as the static in that little video there showed, sometimes we live these lives that are a bit numb, right? Where it's just kind of there. And so here, when someone says, I'm fine, uh, in the Midwest, uh, what, what that basically means is mind your own business, right? That, that's one way of saying it. I'm fine, mind your own business. The other way of saying it is send help immediately because we're really awful. We just don't want to talk about it, right? And, and while that's partially true, there is a sense in which fine for so many of us means really quite literally numb. Numb, like just not feeling anything. Not as good as we could be, right? But, but we, could, we just really don't want to talk about it. If someone says they're okay, it's an invitation to talk. When someone says, fine, it means they aren't great, but I really don't want you to uh, enter into this conversation with me. Fine can have a lot of causes, but what we're going to address in this series is it's pretty specific. It's pretty specific for what kind of cause that we're going to talk about. And to help us get a little bit of a picture of what we're talking about, I want to describe three different scenarios that maybe you can relate to. The first one is this. Uh, scenario number one, you, you wake up in the morning, and as you wake up, you find yourself feeling really tired, really groggy. And you think t back to last night, you're, you're trying to remember what exactly you did. Like, what, what did I spend my time doing last night? And then all of a sudden, it occurs to you, like, oh, oh yeah, I, I spent like four hours on the couch watching Netflix. <laughs> um, <laughs> And like the show was really engaging, it was pretty intense, and like I was on the edge of my seat half the time, but then this morning, I mean last night it was a distraction that kind of was helpful, but this morning uh, it hasn't really helped my life too much. Life's not much better, I still wake up, you still gotta go to work, right? You still gotta do the chores, you gotta do the things, you still kinda got that awkward tension, that like casual unspoken agreement to just exist next to your spouse. Like let's not actually talk about anything. And as you go through the day, you pull out your screen that's in your pocket a few times, a hundred times, you know, and you do a little scrolling, a little micro dosing until the night comes and you can actually fully check out for a little while with another one of the shows because that's all you've really been craving lately, right? Like, just another opportunity to just check out. Check out a life for a little longer. Life's probably more than this, but you know what, this, this is fine. Scenario two, you, you can feel the excitement like pulsing through your body, like it's, it's just there, you can't help but, but feel it. 
You try to look serious and, and concerned on your face, right? You have that look on your face, but it's hard to keep a straight face. You want to hear more. You, you want to share too. You, you just want to know this, right? Like you, you barely keep the anxious desire in check in that moment. And you say to yourself, keep cool, keep cool. Don't, don't show it. But every single time you hear those words, those tantalizing words, you can't help yourself. You you find yourself hearing the words, you'll never believe what I heard. (laughs) The rush they give you has never really gone away. Not only do you love hearing those words, you love when you get to say them, share them. It feels important. It feels powerful, like a drug, right? Each tantalizing detail received and each scandalous story shared feels like taking a hit. You know you should stop. You know it's probably not good for people. It hurts other people sometimes, but so often you do it because you, re- you don't even realize you're doing it. Like it just slips out. It just happens, And it has this effect that the more you think about other people's problems, the more your problems just seem secondary. You don't have to think about them so much. Scenario three. It's 8 p.m. And yours is the only light still on. Maybe it's the light of your computer still crunching numbers. Maybe it's the light in the shop. You got just one more thing to do, one more thing to finish up. Maybe it's the light in your office when everyone else has gone home. First one in, last one to leave. Like a badge of honor, you you wear that title. No one doubts your commitment, no one questions your loyalty. You're there, you're committed. Everyone speaks so highly of you, you're esteemed, you're respected, you are important. The hardest part of the day really is when you gotta go home. The thought is of sitting still, of, of not doing anything, of not being productive, it, it's a bit haunting. And also, you don't feel as important at home. You're not in control at home, and it's a little hard to be there, if we're honest. You prefer to hit the bed exhausted anyways. That way, you don't have to think too much. The work keeps the feelings at bay. Idle hands are the devil's playground, isn't it? There is a reality that all of us live in, and and some of us are aware of it. Some of us realize that it's there. Many of us fool ourselves into believing that it doesn't really apply to us. The best way I can describe it is with that word. I'm fine, fine, I'm fine. Not good, not awful, fine. And you'd better not ask any follow-up questions because fine rarely wants to talk about it. We've found our numbing concoction of choice and and they tend to get us through the day. Technology, Netflix, scrolling, images that give us a hit, living in the sensational, letting the drama of the other people's lives distract us, work, this good thing we often turn into our everything. And there are others too, so many others. For for some, it's the images on their phone, the ones they don't really want to look at but can't stop looking at. Still others, it's it's praise from other people. It's it's the people we serve, right? We serve, we do good things, we help people because we really just want to look good. The feeling of a compliment, praise, it is as heavy of a drug as any. The list goes on, there's so many more. I could be here all day listing them out. And it's filled with this, these things that, that made us, for, for just this tiny little moment in time, they made us feel like alive, like, oh, I feel so good. Like, this is, oh, I love this feeling. And, and it hits you, and, and you get it, and then it fades. As Richard Rohr says, the reason we do anything one more time is because the last time did not really satisfy us deeply. We live consumed by the fleeting feelings these things give. They promise a meaningful life, but end up covering the real thing up. I mean, they, they distract us from a small hit of a feeling, with a small hit of a feeling. Like, like it says in one of my favorite lines from this guy named T.S. Eliot, he's a poet. He says that we are distracted from distraction by distraction. Have you ever sat at your home watching a television 
right? Like you've watched TV, yes? We're with us, okay. And then have you also had a phone or a tablet or both up at the same time? Anybody? Maybe once, twice, right? Distracted by distraction, by distraction, and then somebody talks to me, and here I am, just a dizzying swirl of all kinds of things, and if we get to the end of the night, I'm like, what did I just do? <laughs> oh, man, distracted from distraction by distraction. All of this points to something that Paul says much more bluntly. I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. We all, we all know that feeling, don't we? A couple years ago, I grabbed coffee with someone, uh, and, he, and he told me a story. He talked about how he had something in his life that had consumed him, distracted himself from his life, and the results had been pretty ugly. But as we talked, it was the oddest thing. Uh, while he felt the embarrassment from what happened, he talked as if he was, he was grateful for it. He was grateful for the desperation it had created in him. He called that desperation literally a, a gift. He talked about how getting to that place of desperation had saved him. It had changed his life. We ended up sitting down, the two of us, and, and we recorded a podcast together. You can still find it. It's actually one, I think it has the most views of any of the podcasts we've ever done before. And I'm gonna bring him up at the end of this series on stage, and we're gonna do an interview uh, at the end of the series, so like five weeks from now, four weeks from now. But we ended up sitting down and doing that, right? And, and that conversation began to open my eyes to something. Uh, for him, it had been alcohol and the process in Alcoholics Anonymous had changed the way he lived his life. For me, as I began to research and think about and read about Alcoholics Anonymous and addiction, something became painfully obvious, painfully real. It's this, people who attend AA are often, not always, but often better off than the rest of us. People who attend AA are often better off than the rest of us. That's not what people assume, is it? That's not what we think. They're broken, we think, and you'd be right. But there's power in knowing you're broken. The rest of us are just pretending we're not. They found a place and a group of people who have met them in their desperation. And not only that, they not only met them there, but they continue to meet them there over and over and over and over again. Again, it's painfully obvious. AA groups, they often act more like a church should than most churches do. As it says in one of the books that I read about this, the, the one that largely inspired this series, it's called Breathing Underwater by Richard Rohr. Uh, this is what it says. It says, alcoholics simply have their powerlessness visible for all to see. The rest of us disguise it in different ways and overcompensate for our more hidden and subtle addictions and attachments, especially our addiction to our way of thinking. We're all addicted. We're all numbing ourselves with our personal drug of choice. Some are just more hidden than others. They're causing us to live numb lives, lives that are, you know, fine. Fine. Maybe worse. Certainly not better. Our mission as a church is to represent Jesus well. It, it's what we do. It's why we show up. It's on the walls. But, but here's the thing. We can't do that as individuals or as a church family if we act like we're fine but we're really very broken underneath the surface. We can only pretend for so long before we break. The 12 steps of AA have been shown to work and to work with extraordinary success to the point that hundreds of organizations have adopted and used a version of these steps. And this should not surprise us one bit. It shouldn't surprise us at all, especially here in this room, because at the heart of each of these 12 steps are biblically grounded principles 
They have tapped into what's undeniably true and what's undeniably found in the Bible. We, which got me to thinking, what if we talked about these steps? What if we worked through them together? What would happen if we followed the roadmap laid out in scripture, made clear and simple by these 12 steps and, and chose to be honest enough to, to name the addictions we struggle with? What might change about our church? What might change in our community? How would we, as a church family, represent Jesus more fully because of it? So, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start with steps one through three today and then three steps at a time after that. But one more thing. But before we can really dig into this, there's no substitution for desperation. So I need you to know that these words will be meaningless. They will have no impact on you unless you're willing to look for and admit your own personal area of desperation. And, and if you're here this morning and if you're, you're answering, you know, not me, I don't have one, I'm fine, right? I've got everything under control, it's all good, not me. Uh, I'm gonna say your pants are probably on fire, but I hope, I, I hope you'll listen today so that when you realize what it is, when it finally like, makes its, rears its ugly head and becomes apparent, you know where to start. I, I have a, had a number of things that I've struggled with personally, and, and it'd be silly for me to stand up here and say, you gotta find yours without being just perfectly transparent about my own. I mean the gamut, right? Like images on screens I became addicted to in my teenage years, scrolling social media, checking my phone for updates or emails to a degree that was entirely too distracting. And I'm not immune to those things now, but largely those things uh, are more past than present. But, But there's another one that has proven deeper and more devious than either of these two. One that I constantly struggle with and one that has hurt my family perhaps more than any other. Uh, I desperately crave approval. Uh, I crave people telling me I'm good enough. And it sounds innocent, I know, which makes it dangerous. Uh, It's dangerous because it drives drives hours of work. It it creates a jam-packed schedule because I don't want to let anybody down. It completely messes up my priorities. I mean, it came to a head multiple points for me over the last couple of years. Honestly, I'm still working on this. There is no end to this one. This is one I will always be working on. Uh, During the process of building this building and leading here over the past two years, there have been several points at which I would literally feel utterly paralyzed. Uh, I'd sit at home or in my office and I'd, I'd, I'd literally be shaking. I... (laughs) I'd lay down and I'd say, I, I can't do it all, it's too much. I, I didn't know how to do this and, and I didn't know how to do it and at the same time not disappoint people. You know what I'm talking about? Juggling act of it all. My identity was getting so closely tied to this role, I was addicted to it, addicted to being good enough, to being thought highly enough of, <laughs> to, to all of it. it. It got to the point that my life was becoming unmanageable. And I hesitate sharing this, okay? It can sound like that cheap interview question, you know, like in the pageants or in the, the interviews where they say, what's your worst characteristic, right? Like, what's your biggest weakness? And you're, you answer with, oh, I like to help people too much. And like, oh, come on, man. Like, that's an awful answer. You just made yourself look good. I get it. I know that that's the perception, but that's not what this is. I'm embarrassed by it. I'm embarrassed by the motives underneath it. This role is good. What we do as a church is incredible. Living for the approval it gives is not. Let me explain. It's caused serious damage. In months stacked on months where I was worthless to my wife and kids. I remember so many times I would get home and Meg and I, we we would plan like a night where we'd like try to make it a little more than just like collapsing on the couch. You know what I mean? Have you ever been there? And so we like plan that, like, hey, we'll get the kids to bed early. We'll do something a little set apart to make it a little bit more enjoyable. And I'd get there and I would again 
collapse on the couch. And at the end of those days, uh, I was a pile of nothing. I, I'd given everything out to everyone else all day and she got less than scraps. She barely got fumes. She got blank stares because all the energy was gone. Or the, or the times my kids wanted to play or just have me engage with them and I'd have nothing to give or, or worse. And this happens more than I'd ever like to admit. I was doing emails on my phone because other people's questions and needs seemed in whatever sick way at that moment more important in that hour I had with my kids. You know what I mean? In that evening. It's more important than my kids in that evening. And that, that hurts to think. I didn't want to let these people down. But I prioritized them. By prioritizing them, I let my family down time and time again. And this was not conscious, okay? If someone were to ask me, like, what's the most important group of people in your life? I would answer my family in a heartbeat. That was true. But it's sneaky. It's sneaky. Like, all of these things are sneaky. And I've taken steps, uh, just so you know. Um, I have a group of pastors I chat with about this exact stuff. Uh, for the past six months, it's dramatically improved, but I know this is gonna be a lifelong struggle. Please hear me, I'm not looking for your pity. Those were my choices and I could have led in a healthier way. I share this with you because as I share, I'm guessing you can't help but think of your thing. Here's my question for you. What is it for you? What can't you stop doing? What is leading your life down a path that is not good? What consumes all your time, all your thoughts? Play it out. How does it end for you if you don't address it? If, you, if it goes unchecked, what is the end result? I mean, imagine that moment where the people in your life won't put up with it anymore. I mean, where it doesn't satisfy like it did and, and no amount of it will. What is it? <laughs> We won't ever fully represent Jesus well if we don't begin to wrestle with this thing. Jesus illustrates it this way. It says, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons, which is crazy. It's like saying, I want you dead, dad. And dad says, okay. It goes on. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even, even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. You probably recognize this maybe as the prodigal son story. That's a moment of desperation. What's yours? Sit there. Get there for a moment this morning. Because there's a truth there that this first step requires us to admit. This is step one. We admitted we were powerless over, and for AA, it's alcohol. For us, it's whatever that thing is. And our lives had become unmanageable. Will you admit defeat? Will you let this be your bottom instead of digging deeper? You don't have to dig deeper before admitting it. Paul experienced exactly this moment Something had consumed him, something he could not get rid of. It, it made him weak. We, we don't know exactly what it was, but, but it was there. It's in 2 Corinthians. It says this. It says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. For me, it's the approval of people. It's being viewed or seen as good. It hits a part of my brain that scientists would say releases dopamine and makes me feel good for just that split second and then I want more. 
If I let it get out of hand, it becomes my sole motivation. I'm powerless over it. Life becomes unmanageable because it results in a giving of myself that sacrifices my wife and my family on the altar of, but I'm trying to do something good for these people. What about you? What is it for you? I'm asking you to define it today. If it feels embarrassing, like, yeah, that's just so silly. I don't really want to admit that thing. It's probably that. That's probably it. Step one is admitting. Admitting defeat. Admitting this thing has a power over you that you cannot deal with on your own. Step two. Came to believe that a power greater than us could restore us to sanity. From what I understand, uh, AA does not demand people to believe in a particular God. Uh, This makes it accessible to all kinds of people, which is a good thing. Uh, But it claims, and rightly so, that in order to overcome, to live a life that's not numbed into a just fine sort of existence, that sanity comes from realizing there's a power active in this world that's greater than ourselves. For us, we know that power to be Jesus. But while we're aware of it, do we rely on him? Do our lives illustrate it? Paul got to a place that he had to rely on it. It's in 2 Corinthians 1.8, it says, we think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we experienced, expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God, who raises the dead, and he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. Paul got to that place that I need God and that's the only way I've ever overcome anything of any real value, right? Of any real seriousness. And, And the young man in Jesus' story, the prodigal son's story, has that exact same moment. It's the same exact thing. It says when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. For me, one of the few things that gets me back to a place of sanity and a healthier way of working here is a pretty simple prayer. God, I can't. I can't do this myself. I need you. I need you to lead me. I need you to show me what my priorities should be. I've got nothing left, and I know I'll make choices that are really dumb, so God, I need you. Help. And normally that prayer is prayed in the fetal position. Maybe you've been there. Step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand God. It says in this step, and in this step we can can hear the ending for the younger son in the prodigal story. It says, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. We often think that when we run to God, he's he's waiting there with a big old stick. He's really waiting with a feast. And the exuberant welcome is there because we approach God with humility knowing we don't deserve it, but knowing he's there offering it. 
We've reached a bottom we don't want to tunnel any deeper into and we've decided that what God has for us is better than what we can find or create on our own. It's just a straight up willingness to let God lead our lives. As Paul says in Philippians, dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So here we are. Here we are this morning. We are into the first three steps. How are you doing? Aren't you just so glad that you're here this morning wanting to struggle with the deepest, darkest secrets? I just love that, right? Except it's good. It's good. These are the first three steps. The next nine are just as important, but we have to start somewhere, don't we? We got to start somewhere. So many of us live lives that are fine. I'm fine. Not bad, not great. We say fine because we don't want to talk about it. Dealing with it is too scary. But that's where the danger is. When we wrestle with it, we realize we've made the conscious choice to elevate something in our lives to the position of the thing, the thing, the thing that we talk about, think about, the thing we feel hard pressed to live without, the thing that consumes our actions, consumes our, our thoughts and our desires, and it numbs us. It makes life bearable for a while, but not enjoyable. And unless we admit that addiction, we will not ever be set free from it. It'll chew us up and spit us out again and again and again. So here's where we're gonna start. Here's where we're gonna start. I, I can't encourage you to do this enough. A, a first step is to write it down. So, so hopefully you got a bulletin. If you didn't, there's cards. There should be some space on the back of it. I, I'm, I know I've been in your seat before. Maybe you have a phone. You can bring your phone out. Um, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't wanna do it. <laughs> I don't actually wanna do the thing he's asking me to do because that's uncomfortable. Please, at least make me feel good by pretending to do it. Like grab a piece of paper and like, and your phone or something. I don't care. Just at least like give me a little bit of a help out to keep going here and pretend to do it. I'm asking you to write these things down. Three things, and it says on the back of your bulletin, right? There's a space for that. There should be pens. Uh, the first step is this. We admitted we were powerless over blank and our lives have become unmanageable. I want you to write down, I'm powerless over wanting other people's approval. It has made my life unmanageable. I'm gonna leave this up there for a while, so you got some time. Don't stress that I'm gonna keep going. I'm powerless over blank. It has made my life unmanageable. Number two, I can't fix this on my own, right? Come to believe, came to believe that the power greater than us could restore us to sanity. So I want you to write down, I can't fix this on my own. I need a power greater than me to restore my sanity. So write it down, type it out, whatever it is. And then the third step it says, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand God. I choose to turn my will and life over to God. I want you to write it out. Some people are smart, they're taking pictures. If you want to take a picture of that, you can. This is the starting place. This is not the ending place. This is the beginning. Here's how to take this further. After you've written it down, don't crumple it up and throw it away. Don't hide it in your pocket. Don't slip it into your Bible and never look at it again. Share it. Share it with God. Have a prayer, have a conversation with God about it. With another person, someone you know you feel safe with. Uh, there'll be people up here after the service for prayer. It happens every, every week, they're always there, but if that's something that you would desire, that'd be a great opportunity to use them. Maybe, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a spouse, but, but there's one rule with this, okay? You gotta hear this rule, please hear this rule. The rule is this, no forcing or shaming into sharing. Don't do it. 
If they don't want to do it, it is okay. It's just not time yet, and you've got to be patient. That's just the, the long and short of it. Don't shame in the sharing. If someone isn't ready to share, forcing them will make it worse. It needs to be their choice. It needs to be their choice. And if you're not ready yet to take that step required to live more alive, more awake, less numb, that's okay. Take some time, but, but no God's here. No God's waiting. Don't hang on for too long. It's only gonna get worse. But there's so much potential for better. Maybe you're ready, right? Maybe you're like, I want to do this, but I, I, I need to do something significant to signify it to myself. Um, two weeks from now, it, this, it didn't realize it's correlated so well, but, but it does. Uh, two, th- excuse me, May 5th, um, we are having uh, a baptism. Normally we do it in the summer. We're gonna mix it up a little bit, but we're gonna do a baptism service here uh, in this building. And when we do it, uh, It'll be next week a chance to have a, like, ask about it, have a class after the service. It'll be a 15-minute class after both services. But, but think about that. Listen to this. Uh, when you get baptized, you are saying, I am powerless over these things in my life, these powers in my life. It, it makes my life unmanageable. I can't do this on my own, God. I can't fix this on my own. I need a power greater than myself to restore myself. God, I need you. Jesus, I need you. I need to follow you. You are the only one that can make me come alive. And then finally, I choose to turn my will and life over to God. That is very literally the act of baptism. Trusting Jesus. So if that's something you want to do, and and if you're in a place like I've been wanting to get baptized for a long time, this is my my step. Next week, after both services, make sure you're at those meetings. We'll get more details and ready for you next week. Don't don't hold on that. No, no, there's a tricky piece to this. Maybe you've caught it. Uh, Some things we can... Some things we can cut out, right? Like we can remove them from our lives. We can delete apps. We can daily choose not to drink. We can avoid some things altogether. It's a reality. Other things we can't. Uh, We can't not work. We can't not eat. We can't not interact with people. It's pretty hard to live without a phone. Some people do it, but man, it's hard. So we can cut out certain things, some things, but some things we have to monitor. The steps are still the same. Don't just give up because you have to monitor them. Don't just say, oh, this thing I have to have in my life because of X, Y, and Z. No, there, there are options as you walk through these steps to continue to keep them in check. It's important. Don't let that be an excuse. And finally, I can't say this loudly or fully or explanation point enough. I'm no expert. Uh, I'm working through this with all of you. But I tell you what, I know I want the power of God at work in my life. And I want it at work in our church's life and the life of this community because of what we do together what we're willing to go to, to to be honest about our weaknesses and see God's strength because of it. I don't want anything to steal God's power from my life. So humbly, I ask you to walk through this with me these next few weeks. Let this be the beginning of a culture in this church where we are the safest, most welcoming place imaginable and we see people's lives changed because of the power of Jesus. If you want to be part of that, would you take a moment right now and pray with me? Dear God, it's so funny as we walk through these steps to see, uh, well, one, how true they are, but also how obvious they are when we think about you and the way you teach us through the Bible and the way you you teach us through your Son So today, we we simply say, to the best of our ability, we surrender. (laughs) We are done putting up a front. We're done with saying, fine, don't talk to me about it. I'm fine. And we say, God, I want to experience this life in all its fullness. Not with glamour, not with some hyper, everything's great mentality, but with a real 
sober sense of good life live for you in the ups and downs. Help us to do that well. Help us to follow you. Help us to choose you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. What's the date of that worship night? 19th. 19th. <laughs> See ya. I can make